Welcome everyone to Wednesday Night at the Lab. I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for UW Extension and Cooperative Extension. And by, uh, on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, Wisconsin Public Television, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the UW-Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce to you John Denu. He's a professor here in biomolecular chemistry and at the Wisconsin Institute for Discovery. John was born in Beloit, Wisconsin. <laughs> on the bonnie banks of the Rock River. And as I pointed out to him, the, uh, the water that flows out of Beloit flows into my hometown of Dixon, Illinois. And once again, I'm glad for sewage treatment plants. <laughs> John went to Beloit Catholic High School, which no longer exists. Uh, and then he came here to UW-Madison, which still exists. He studied biochemistry as an undergrad. Then he went to Texas A&M to study biochemistry. And the most famous line about Texas A&M is, 100 years of tradition unimpeded by progress. <laughs> yeah, an Aggie taught me that. Then he went to the University of Michigan for a postdoc, and then he was on the faculty at the uh, Oregon Health Sciences University in Portland, Oregon. Then he came back to UW-Madison to be on the faculty here in 2003. Tonight he gets to talk with us about healthy minds for a lifetime, from molecules to mindfulness. Please join me in welcoming John Denu to Wednesday Night at the Lab. Thank you for, can you hear me? Thank you for being here tonight. It's a real pleasure uh, to present uh, um, some of the work that we've been doing. Um, I'd like to start off uh, by introducing a very familiar concept, DNA. Um, DNA is destiny. DNA is king. We hear comments about DNA all the time. Um, it's in our DNA. That's what many companies try to sell you as a motto to convey a concept that is supposed to be so intrinsically linked to their brand that they're really one and the same. An automaker may say performance is part of our DNA, uh, suggesting that they actually had no choice right, to build cars that are performance cars. It's just what they do. Um, we may tell our grandson, you can't help be as stubborn as you are. <laughs> it's, in your, it's, in, it's in your DNA. Um, his father was as stubborn as a mule, right? <laughs> so in actual biology, uh, DNA is actually a polymer of genetically encoded information. Uh, list shown here uh, is the familiar double helix with the four uh, bases that make up the genetic code. So just a sort of a refresher on, on uh, the biology of DNA. DNA encodes uh, genetic information that's transcribed to a single ribonucleic acid polymer, RNA. That information is translated to protein. That protein has a particular molecular function. That molecular <coughs> function can give rise to the indicated phenotype. Now, here I've <coughs> listed an example, the LC the LCT gene, which uh, codes for lactase. The gene, uh, when transcribed, uh, <clears throat> is made into a messenger RNA. That information is then translated uh, to protein. And lactase is an enzyme, so it's a, it's a protein enzyme. 
uh, which has a molecular function. It's, it catalyzes the conversion or the, the hydrolysis of two of a disaccharide, uh, lactose, into two molecules, glucose and galactose. And the phenotype is, is uh, essentially the ability of the organism, in this case, to digest uh, uh, lactose for energy or for other biopolymer formation. Now, it turns out that there are actually polymorphisms or DNA changes in some uh, human beings that allows them to, uh, 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 well, that, that perhaps uh, provides lactose intolerance or manifests as lactose intolerance. So in other words, the inability to express enough lactase to deal with uh, milk products that we ingest. Um, it turns out that those mutations, that those changes in DNA, that's genetic, um, those changes are actually not even in the gene. They're in a subsequent gene, but they somehow affect the expression of the lactase gene. That's somewhat un understandable, but it turns out that there's actually the expression of lactase, which actually decreases as we age. Um, the exp the, uh, some of the expression of lactase has nothing to do with changes to DNA. In other words, it, pen, it potentially, the expression of lactase among individuals might be totally dependent on the epigenome. Okay? A set of instructions that helps regulate the expression of genes. It has nothing to do essentially with changes to the DNA sequence. So perhaps DNA is not king. Okay? Perhaps DNA is not our destiny. This was a, a, a Times article, I think about eight or ten years ago. So this has tremendous impact for human health. The fact that perhaps DNA is not our destiny. I think this is great news. In fact, I've always, over the last several decades, DNA has gotten a little too much attention, I think. And we've, we get our DNA sequenced, tells us who we are, potentially tells us whether we have a disease mutation, right? Do we have a mutation that correlates strongly or correlates somewhat with a particular disease? We've given, many of us have been told, one gene, one function. There's a gay gene, there's a, there's a alcoholism gene. I never liked that. <laughs> I think that's bad science. Um, but it makes life simple, doesn't it? Um, and what if, you know, a lot of people want to know <clears throat> their DNA sequence. And a lot of other people, I would say, don't want to know their DNA sequence. They'd rather not know they have a, a mutation that gives them a higher chance of a particular disease, say a cancer mutation. But I would say this, if you knew, if you had that information, and you had information about your epigenome, about this information that sits on top of the genome, that potentially can regulate the expression of that cancer gene, and you could find a drug or a lifestyle or a diet that influenced the expression of that gene based on your epigenome, wouldn't you want to know that? So I come from the camp, more knowledge is good, is better, okay? So let's think about, let's dig a little deeper <clears throat> into the epigenome and how it's regulated. So one, <clears throat> so at the level of control of gene expression, uh, the epigenome essentially sits right here. The, the epigenetic control of gene expression sits between uh, the encoded information in DNA and whether or not that information is transcribed 
into this message that ultimately will give you a functional gene. This is where the regulation occurs. This is where the epigenome plays a major role. I like to think of comparing, thinking about the genome and the epigenome uh, using this metaphor. Um, <clears throat> the genome or the DNA sequence is like the hardware of a computer. And the epigenome is the software or the applications that you're using at that time. So different applications give you very different functionalities, all with, a basically, with basically the same hardware. That, I think, is a reasonable way to think about the epigenome. Different functionalities, but with the same framework, the same basic design. It's the epigenome or epigenetics that helps explain the difference between two cells in our body that basically have the same DNA sequence but have very different functions. In the left, we have a liver cell, a hepatocyte. On the right, uh, we have a neuron. And it, what makes these different? They have the same DNA. What makes them different is the differential gene expression in one cell versus the other. Not all genes are being expressed all the time. That wouldn't, that wouldn't work, right? So different functionalities are built in based on what set of genes are expressed in a, give a particular cell type. But this raises, this is a difficult challenge for a cell. Because it turns out that the DNA in, in each cell is about two meters in length. Okay, so that's about, that's about like that. Okay, that's how, so from the floor to there. Not from the top of my head <laughs> to, to the hand. Just thought about that. Um, so two meters uh, of DNA in every single cell. And, and in most cells you can't even see without a microscope. But all that DNA has to get packaged into a little nucleus in each cell. Okay? So it's important that the cell knows how to access the right genes at the right time. But just to give you a sense of how much DNA that is, I mean, every time I do this calculation, I, I, it blows my mind. But let's think about it. Here, here's a recent example. Okay. So we have enough DNA. Uh, we have a lot of DNA in our cell. We have about 37 trillion cells in our body on average. Um, so imagine that you got to go hitch a ride on the New Horizons spacecraft. And you got to take your cell phone, your smartphone, and you're heading to the, heading to the edge of the solar system um, and with a rendezvous with Ultima Thule. Okay? You'd have enough DNA. Uh, by the way, that's four billion miles away. You'd have enough DNA in yourself, in distance-wise, to go to Ultimate Thule, snap some pictures on your smartphone, come back to Earth, upload them on Facebook to your friends. Um, but it turns out, the bad news is, you forgot to bring your phone charger. So, but the good news is, you can, um, you have enough DNA left to come back to Earth, get your charger, and then head back. Okay? The bad news is you don't have enough DNA to come back home. <laughs> so that's a lot of DNA. So there's cell machinery in the nucleus that's responsible for expressing a subset of those genes. And it has a real, it has a difficult, it has difficulty, or it could have difficulty trying to figure out in all that DNA, where, what genes should I be expressing? Okay, that's a lot of DNA. So how does it, so how does it do this? It needs directions.
Well, generally speaking, it's easier to follow directions given with landmarks, which is why Google Maps has now uh, adopted this practice. So instead of saying head north on north southeast 23rd Street, we seem to, we tend to like um, head towards the Columbia River and take a right at the Taco Bell. That's what the epigenome essentially functions, how the epigenome functions. It provides these landmark directions to the sites of genes that need to be expressed. However, they're not quite landmarks in the sense that I just, the, the example I gave, um, it's different. These are small chemical landmarks. And these are landmarks that are put on, these are chemical groups that are put on by cellular enzymes in our, in our bodies, in, our, in the nucleus, okay? So they directly modify DNA, shown here, they can methylate, these DNA bases that I showed you in the second slide, um, that's in, that turns out to be important information, important landmark information. The cell also modifies proteins by a whole array of modifications, chemical modifications. Again, directed modifications that are done um, by enzymes in our, in our cells. They can modify the protein. These are the amino acids that get modified on a protein. And uh, these proteins are important because these are the proteins called histones that act as the molecular spools and sort of wind up the DNA so it can be packaged neatly in the nucleus. That's a set of chemical landmarks that the epigenome provides. Okay. Can the epigenome be changed? And what can change it? This is an, I'm not going to provide all the answers because I, we don't know all the answers. I'm going to provide you what, uh, the kinds of things that we're working on, the kinds of questions that, we're, that keep us up at night. Um, and I'll provide a little bit of information about where, uh, what kinds of, uh, some of the results we have and, and some very preliminary data as well that we're super excited about. Now, There's certainly strong evidence that environment, lifestyle, and diet can have a profound effect on human health. Um, but there's more and more evidence that suggests that this, that the effect is actually happening at the level of our epigenome. That we're changing the, the landmarks in a way perhaps that are beneficial to us, but perhaps in ways that are not. And this can affect Essentially, this, this uh, leads to, to potentially major alterations in our epigenome. Uh, two examples that I like to cite. One is from the Dutch famine near the end of World War II, where uh, pregnant mothers who suffered the, the famine during the first two trimesters of, of their pregnancy uh, gave birth to children that later in life had a much higher incidence of metabolic disease that includes diabetes, for instance. Um, some research in that area suggests this is an epigenetic phenomena. And of course, sort of, uh, it, it's certainly not a genetic phenomenon because it happened to, it's very, it happened at a fairly high prevalence. Then there's a more controlled experiment here um, done in the laboratory. These two mice at the bottom of the slide here, these mice are genetically identical, which is hard to believe. The only difference is in the epigenome of the two, the difference lies in the epigenome of the two mice. It turns out there's a, there's a genetic allele, a genetic location that if it gets methylated, has an effect on gene expression of a, a series of genes that either make the, uh, lead to a mouse that's sort of yellow and obese or a normal uh, brown um, uh, lean mouse. 
And this effect can be modulated simply by things in the diet like choline or exposure to molecules like man-made molecules like bisphenol A, which you guys have probably heard about. So these are two, I think, quite good examples of the power of the epigenome and how it can impact uh, both human and animal health. This is profoundly interesting to me in how, life, how <clears throat> things like diet and molecules can affect the epigenome. And I'm a biochemist, as, as I was in, so at every stage of my training, I've been trained as a biochemist. I think in molecules, I think in mechanisms. I want to understand what's happening at the molecular level. And so I want to briefly <coughs> tell you about a, about a study uh, that we did look, uh, looking for evidence, direct evidence, that metabolism or metabolites themselves can have an influence uh, on the epigenome. And there's a very important reason why in, um, they do in this, in this particular case. So <clears throat> we performed a number of experiments where we have genetically or nutritionally um, lowered the cell's ability to make this molecule here. SAM. Now SAM is really critical because SAM donates this little red methyl group to, uh, to the epigenome. And here it's uh, shown as a little uh, methyl group here on this, uh, on this uh, part of chromatin, uh, this part of the epigenome. Interestingly, SAM <coughs> comes from methionine. Methionine is an essential amino acid. Uh, and the methyl group from methionine is, is ultimately what gets transferred to uh, this, in, this epigenetic information. And methionine, as I mentioned, is an essential amino acid. It comes from our diet. Uh, so this was one of the, one of the strategies that uh, uh, my graduate student, Spencer Hawes, a uh, PhD student in the lab, did in collaboration with uh, Dudley Lamming and uh, Vince Krines in the medical school. Um, to test how modulating SAM levels can affect the epigenome uh, in both a cell culture model as well as a mouse model. So up here at the top, I'm showing a, that's a little petri dish with mammalian cells growing. Um, this is a mouse, um, blue mouse. And so basically, um, we have uh, altered either genetically or nutritionally, the levels of SAM, so the levels of this metabolite that's critical for methylating uh, and modifying the epigenome. We extracted tissues from the mice after, uh, after these studies or extracted the, the uh, molecules in, in, uh, from the cell culture, uh, both metabolites as well as epigenetic information um, in those histone proteins, for instance. We put them through a number of experimental uh, instruments uh, to quantify the changes. This is the analysis, the statistical um, and analytics experiment uh, analysis shown here. And ultimately, we're quantifying how the, the epigenome has changed okay? in response to that nutritional or genetic um, alteration of SAM levels. And the figure on the bottom is just to show you the dramatic changes that occurred. Okay? I think the colors are a little muted uh, in this projector, um, but this is a time course from 15 minutes all the way out to 24 hours. And on the right here, uh, these are some of the landmarks, if you will, the chemical land landmarks that I talked about that, that essentially can change uh, within the epigenome. So there's a dramatic effect of altering SAM levels. Um, and we have shown this has, uh, this has a huge effect on the expression of particular genes. Now, from a number of studies I don't have time to show you, um, we learned that the cell does everything it can to help maintain epigenetic information when there's a metabolic stress like low SAM levels. It knows that's really important. And we're still here, so I think that show, I mean, 
We've, throughout human evolution, we've, you know, hunter-gatherers, you know, Western diets. We've been able to cope with really crappy diets and starvation for long periods of time. So it's not surprising, but we've uncovered some really cool mechanisms that we think are critical for the cell to help, its, to help maintain that epigenetic information so it doesn't forget it's a neuron, right? If you go, so if you're, perhaps you're on a vegan diet, this is, um, turns out that methionine is quite low in a vegan diet, typically. Um, so you have to be careful, you can actually take methionine as a supplement. Um, uh, but if you eat a lot of meat and other things, you, you might be getting plenty of methionine. There's actually some health benefits to lowering methionine. Anyway, we can talk about that perhaps in the Q&A session. But the bottom line is the cell is trying really hard to maintain this epigenetic information during a metabolic uh, stressful, uh, nutritional stress. We add back methionine, okay? So we restricted the methionine, and then we added it back. And the cool thing is the system went right back to where it was. The epigenome went right back. Now, we didn't extend this too far, but we did do one experiment. Spencer did an experiment. I didn't do an experiment. Spencer, during that methionine restriction, he added an inhibitor-like molecule, a small molecule that blocks some of the pathways that we've uncovered that were critical for the response to this nutritional deprivation. So it's like taking the other leg out of the stool, right? What happened then when we gave, so this inhibitor blocked some of these pathways. When we gave methionine back, the cell didn't get back to where it was. It was altered. Its epigenome was altered and transcriptional. So the genes that were being transcribed, it was a different set of genes. And we think this will probably lead to genomic instability and bad news uh, down, down the road. Okay, so we think that factors that affect the epigenome include diet, uh, lifestyle, stress, environmental uh, factors. Um, but we've been quite interested over the last, I guess, four plus years now in the microbiome, the gut microbiome. Um, Around the same time that I started working in this area through, through collaborations, I'm pretty confident that a fecal transplant saved my mom's life. I'm pretty sure of that. So, um, so I'm a believer. <laughs> I think the microbiome is having a pretty huge impact on us, maybe some of us more than others. Um, but this is a fascinating area that I want to tell you a little bit about and how it connects to the epigenome of the host in this case, okay? So the gut microbiota, I want to talk just about the, the gut microbiota. So over the last, I don't know, five to ten years, I would say, there's, there's really been a tremendous interest in this area. There's been a lot of really interesting correlative studies that suggest correlations between the, the communities that are in our gut and whether or not they associate with, say, diet, uh, 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 diabetes and obesity, uh, whether they associate with anxiety, whether they associate with depression, any number of, of, of human afflictions. And it turns out you can actually transplant a microbiota from a mouse that um, is anxious, has anxious phenotype, and put it into a germ-free mouse and make that mouse anxious. And you can also take human microbiota, gut microbiota, from an obese diabetic, and you can give that fecal transplant, if you will, from a human to a mouse, and you can make that mouse diabetic. I mean, this is my... I, I, this is my, there's something really cool going on. As a basic scientist, I want to understand that. A lot of people would like to understand that. But again, I like molecules. I want to understand who's responsible and how are they responsible. Okay? 
So we've evolved with bacteria. Um, and for the most part, you know, they're our buddies. I think we're now coming to appreciate they're, they're more our buddies perhaps than they're not. Um, and in fact, we get vitamins. They, can, they help supply us with vitamins, absorption of vitamins in our gut. Um, they actually increase our metabolic capacity by 500 fold because of all the cool metabolic reactions that they can catalyze in our guts. So they take undigested polysaccharides and use them for carb, use them for energy. And some of the consequences of that, so the fermentation in our gut, uh, is the production, if we eat a lot of fiber for sure, um, is the production of, of these three short chain fatty acids, acetate, propionate, and butyrate. Just want you to remember that for a second. So we set out to ask the question, do gut microbiota influence or affect the epigenome of the host? In this case, we're using a mouse model. This is a, a beautiful collaboration with Federico Ray, uh, who's a microbiologist here uh, on campus, uh, and we continue to work, as, as I'll tell you in a second. Um, and the majority of work that I want to briefly touch on is, is, was performed by an MD-PhD student in my lab, uh, Kim Krautkramer. So we basically took um, germ-free mice, so here they are in a bubble, that's to, that's to suggest that they are germ-free, um, and conventionalized mice, or even conventionally raised mice. Conventionalized mouse is a mouse that began life germ-free and then was inoculated, okay? So it's, a, it's sort of another control, a good control experiment. So we basically um, uh, compared the germ-free mouse to a conventionalized mouse, either on a normal, sort of normal uh, mouse diet as well as a high-fat, high-sucrose diet, uh, and um, analyzed the tissues. In this case, that's liver, uh, colon, and adipose tissue, so fat tissue, and quantified the um, quantified changes to the epigenome through that chemical information that I told you about previously. Well, the bottom line is yes. <laughs> the epigenome is changed when comparing a germ-free mouse to a conventional, conventionalized mouse or even, even a conventionally ra raised mouse. Okay? And it turns out that the changes were hugely muted under a high-fat, high-sucrose diet. We're not sure exactly why that is, but essentially, on a high-fat, high-sucrose diet, the bugs don't have much fiber. They, they don't have much to chew on. So they're probably not producing the kind of uh, small molecules in effect on the host, as you, one might expect from a chow diet that would have, as a percentage, more fiber. Now, the really sort of more basic science question here was, as I mentioned before, short-chain fatty acids are produced in quite large concentrations in the gut. During f for fermentation. So this is acetate, propionate, and butyrate. So we gave a germ-free mouse just those three in the drinking water, actually. A germ-free mouse. And then we asked, okay, let's analyze the tissues from these guys and compare it to see if that mimics or not being colonized. Because it, one of the questions we're asking is, what are the molecules that the bugs are producing or having an effect on that, that, are, that are affecting the host of uh, affecting the uh, host organism, in this case the mouse. Okay? Are there molecules that are mediating these changes? The data here I, is, is just, I think, <coughs> striking. You can just look at the, the, essentially these are correlation plots and the right, the right two panels basically compare a conventionalized mouse to a mouse that was germ-free but just given three short chain fatty acids. Okay? There's a really strong correlation. I mean, this is really good in, this, in these kinds of experiments, both in the liver and the colon. So, so three short chain fatty acids could mimic to a large extent the epigenetic changes that we noted in the liver and the colon. So molecules 
these molecules, perhaps there's other molecules that are sufficient <coughs> to alter the epigenome of the host, right? And what are they? We want to understand that. So this has, these projects have evolved and our interests continue to evolve and we've become more and more interested in understanding this connection between the brain and the gut and largely right through changes in the microbiota which can be, which can be affected by diet, by exercise, by all kinds of things as, as we're learning about. So how does the microbiota influence the gut and therefore influence or, 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 or um, molecules it produces or effects it has? How is it affecting the brain? There's been some really um, amazing articles that have come out. In fact, I've highlighted two here because this is from our colleagues here at Wisconsin, Frederico Ray and Barb Bedlin, um, who published some really... And, and, and we're trying to follow up, and, and I'll, I'll tell you briefly about that, on some of these, these observations. So, um, so Barb and, and uh, Federico demonstrated that in Alzheimer's disease, there is definitely an alteration in the microbiota, the gut microbiota of, of folks with suffering from Alzheimer's, as well as my, mild cognitive impairment. That's a cor these are correlations. Okay? So we don't know if they're causal. Also, more recently, uh, Federico and Barb published this paper, um, which again it has to do with a molecule that's produced by, it's derived from uh, gut microbiota, and that is trimethylamine oxide, which is elevated in Alzheimer's uh, patients as well as those suffering from mild cognitive impairment. Okay. Trimethylamine oxide is directly a product is a product of certain bacteria that can convert, for instance, choline in our diet to trimethylamine. And trimethylamine then gets taken up in our liver, it's absorbed in the gut, taken up in the liver, and then actually oxidized to trimethylamine oxide. And that's usually what's circulating at high fairly can, can circulate at fairly high concentrations in our bodies and has been already correlated with cardiovascular disease and a number of other human uh, uh, afflictions. In a somewhat related experiment, we wondered whether the epigenome could be altered in a model of Alzheimer's disease. So we found that, and, and this is work from, from uh, James Dahl, a scientist in my group, who showed that um, in two different models of Alzheimer's disease, there are alterations in the epigenome. And those are highlighted by this, these two differences here. These are the two different models. Uh, so this shows the expression of a particular uh, spooler, if you will, of DNA um, that is uh, altered, as well as changes to these epigenetic and land, uh, chemical landmarks, if you will, uh, on, uh, on specific um, histone proteins within um, the AD model. So this suggests that there is an alteration in, at least in two models of, two mouse models of Alzheimer's disease, there's a change in the epigenome. And this is actually in hippocampal, um, sex, uh, hippocampus, uh, where most of the uh, issues arise in Alzheimer's. So, I should mention, um, we're working with Federico on trying to establish what does trimethylamine oxide do? Could we, and we're setting up an experiment where we're going to look at mice, germ-free mice, well, doesn't matter the details, but we're going to set up a mouse experiment so we can determine directly, does trimethylamine oxide directly affect the epigenome and how? Um, and that's an experiment a set of experiments that, that's be done in collaboration with Frederica Ray and a, a graduate student in my lab, uh, Sydney Thomas. So stay tuned. We're super jazzed about this. It's like all of the, the planets are, to use another planetary uh, <laughs> or, or a space body, um, the planets are aligning, I think. Um, 
but we're very excited about um, the outcomes of that study. So continuing on with this idea of the, the gut-brain axis and, and something that we continue to be fascinated with um, is another pilot study that we've done with uh, Ryan Haringa, who's a uh, MD-PhD uh, uh, researcher. Uh, he's a professor in psychiatry. Uh, Joel Handelsman, who's our WID director, and David Page, who's uh, uh, from Biostats and, and, and Medical Informatics. Uh, we're basically asking questions about the effect of the, ep the, the, effect of, um, the, micro the microbiome on adolescent depression. What are the associated metabolic and epigenetic abnormalities in kids with uh, adolescents suffering from, from depression? Can the microbiome, met uh, the metabolites and epigenetic profiles predict those that would respond to antidepressants, the SSRIs, for instance. Um, this is in some ways, right, a path to personalized medicine, which I think we need still a lot of good basic science and the kinds of analyses that I'm describing for you today that are not routinely being done uh, to do, uh, to do uh, personal medicine, to do, I prefer to, to think of it as personal, well, uh, 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 precision wellness as a, as a as opposed to precision medicine, because I think let's, let's stop it before it becomes medicine, okay? For medicine is required. So this is, an exp uh, this is a, a, a pilot study we're very excited about that, again, links these things we're very interested in, the microbiome, epigenetics, uh, and metabolism that can link those two together. Um, we're also... Um, this is a th the third study that's linked, that, that has a connection to the, to the, the gut-brain axis. Uh, so my lab and Joe Handelsman lab is partnering with the Center for uh, Healthy Minds, um, uh, uh, and we're partnering with them on their um, mindful police study, where they're basically asking the impact of a training program in mindfulness practices um, on the stress and stress-related health outcomes uh, of police officers. So this is a... a a, a fun study that involves the um, Madison, the uh, Madison Police, uh, University Police, and uh, the Dane County Sheriff's Department. Uh, and this was a grant originally funded uh, for um, a grant to Dan uh, Group from uh, from the Center for Healthy Minds. So what we're trying to do is partner with them and and interrogate the alterations to the microbiome and the epigenome and try to. These are really just beginning, these are discovery experiments. But we're in, a, we're in a position, right, where we can do it. We're in a position that what kind of new insight might we get from just initially just correlations, right? Is the microbiome altered under three months of mindful practices, for instance? Does that alter the epigenome of immune cells, of our, of our circulating immune cells, which can be responsible for, for initiating and, and accelerating some of the immune response uh, and stress response uh, of um, under, <laughs> under stressful conditions, okay? So collectively at, at the Wisconsin Institute for Discovery, um, we're sort of taking this group of, uh, of projects, these pilot projects, and trying to build essentially a molecular pipeline um, where we do interrogate the microbiome, we do interrogate the epigenome, we can interrogate the, metabol the metabolome as well, so the, the metabolites that give us a sense of what's, uh, what's changed. Uh, there's, other, there's, other, there's other clinical markers that we could also, um, uh, that we could also uh, uh, integrate into this study. So this is, the st this is our depression, mindfulness, and, and AD study. But what else, can we, what else can we fit into this pipeline? Okay, that's, that's, that is something we hope to build a pipeline where, where folks can come to us and say, we've got this really interesting cohort of folks that we'd like to understand the molecular basis of something uh, that we don't understand, okay? And so 
Integration of multi-omics is something we're very keen on uh, in integrating that with clinical and epidemiological data. And imagine what could come out of this, right? Uh, predict health outcomes. Obviously, the possibility of diagnostics. Um, because there's a lot of data, this is very heavy data science um, as well. Um, we think there'll be new innovation that comes out of the data science component of this. And this really builds on the strengths at the Wisconsin Institute for Discovery, where we have strengths in epigenetics, we have strengths in the microbiome, and we have strengths in data science, in addition to, um, uh, some, in, in addition to metabolism and stem cell biology. Um, as I mentioned before, a lot of these studies are first pass discovery experiments, okay? And as, I told, as you know, I'm a biochemist. I like we like mechanism. This is a starting point, right? And this might be okay for diagnostics, but ultimately, you know, one of the strengths of Wisconsin, one of many strengths of the University of Wisconsin, is how many basic researchers we have on this campus. How many people like to dig in to the weeds and understand how this thing works? And we can test causality, right? That's a key. Testing causality. And I think what we're going to end up with is a ton of hypotheses that we can test. Like, oh, this molecule is upregulated under this condition. This leads to this epigenetic change. Are they connected? And how are they connected? Those are the kinds of things that we want to understand. And so having a notobiotic facility we have now on campus, we can use genetic mouse models. Uh, and I'll, and I'll show you just in the last uh, slide or two uh, examples of how we want to adapt and utilize organoids to study. Right? We can't study humans the way we can study mice because we can get tissues out and do genetic experiments. Um, uh, but there's a lot we can do using organoids in vitro. Okay? So these are the examples of the kinds of things that can be done to test causality. And that's an important uh, consideration. So one of the things I want to leave you with tonight is, is something that um, we're excited about that's really a, a um, um, I would say, a, a a uh, consequence of all of these experiments and, and interests in the gut-brain access. Um, and we're putting together a grand challenge. So what is that? Well, that's like an audacious goal, right? We're calling it Brainspan 100. The, the idea is this. People are living longer. Um, but is our, are our minds keeping up, right? Um, so we can, you know, 100 lifespans are not, 100 year lifespans are, are not that crazy. I mean, the, project, the predictions uh, are pretty amazing in terms of how, what human life expectancy uh, is and is going to be. So can we have a full life, right, 100 year lifespan without, right, without uh, issues of the brain, okay? Whether that's autism, whether that's depression, whether that's all, dementia, Alzheimer's. Anxiety, okay? So, can we have 100 year lifespans without, uh, or sorry, I should say with a healthy brain? So, we want to characterize treatable brain disorders with this multi omic analysis. We want to see commonalities among these various human afflictions or disease or, or uh, uh, conditions Alzheimer's, PTSD, for instance, depression, maybe autism anxiety, um, and pursued treatments, really precision medicine, precision wellness, really that, that's based on this new data and uh, this new understanding. Um, we want to unite diverse researchers across uh, campus uh, to tackle this problem. Um, so this is sort of the hundred, yeah, so this is just sort of from more uh, uh, indication of, of the um, areas that we try to connect. This is 100, you know, do you want to live to be 100? Maybe. If your brain, you know, if, if the system was okay, you'd probably say yes. How much do we need to think about our epigenome? 
And how much is our microbiome playing a role in, um, in, in this process? Okay, those are some of the questions. So this is really, this is almost science fiction, but this is, these, are, <laughs> these are real uh, images from several colleagues that we've been trying to get together to jumpstart a project that's really, uh, it's really almost science fiction, but I think we can do it, okay? And that is, can we build in vitro a gut-brain model? We have colleagues, Randy Ashton, who's building, who's making from human um, stem cell, adult stem cells, making little organoids on a, on a slide in uniform in, uniform, in a uniform way, little brain organoids. Um, our colleague, Laura Noel, is building intestinal, or intestinal organoids. And she's co-culturing these with bacteria. So in vitro, and using microfluidics devices. So wouldn't it be cool? And, 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 and other folks, like uh, um, Eric Schuster, has built a very beautiful blood-brain barrier. So we could, artif we could make a brain organoid, right? We can make an intestinal organoid here that's co-cultured with the bacteria that we say, okay, we're, let's put these strains of bacteria in and measure these metabolites out. Let's fuse let, through microfluidics, perhaps even this is also an attempt to vascular, vascularize the whole thing, which would be super cool. But basically, can we connect them and ask, right, in a very controlled, quantifiable way, who, who, how is the gut talking to the brain? And how can we understand some of the molecular events that lead to dysfunction in the brain through molecules, through, in, through, through um, and ultimately, uh, we want to understand how gene expression and development are affected in, uh, for instance, the brain organoid sort of as an endpoint. But of course, these two are talking to each other, so you can imagine uh, uh, connecting uh, uh, connecting it through through uh, uh, the other direction. So, okay. So, um, so this, as 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 most grand challenges are are, are supposed to be, it's. It's audacious, um, it's bold, <clears throat> um, but why not, right? Um, so we are trying to uh, crowdsource some of these solutions from both researchers and the public. Uh, ideally, we want to accelerate the progress on this project um, and get input from diverse groups of folks. That includes the public, it includes uh, 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 researchers, this is a this is a this is a a, a large undertaking. It's going to take a lot of folks with a lot of diverse skills. Um, we will be planning a town hall where uh, we would love both uh, researchers on campus that want to get involved as well as uh, the public to see what can be done to have input into the kinds of solutions that we may come up with. So I, uh, if you're interested, uh, please contact uh, Nolan uh, to stay connected. Uh, and we will, if you, we can get on our email list and we'll, uh, and we'll keep you informed on, on events and when this town hall um, will be uh, scheduled. It hasn't been scheduled yet. You know, how do we connect people? Um, perhaps that's, I mean, just engaging with you tonight is a way to connect with and let you know what we're trying to accomplish, okay? And you may say, oh, John, um, I know this researcher at the Marshville Clinic who's doing something that overlaps with stuff you're doing. Do you, do you know this person? And I, I'll probably say, no, I don't know that person. Can you connect us? Can you make the introdu email introduction? I can't tell you how many times that happens. And just by engaging in people, you realize there's some connections. There's, there's, there's ways in which we can help each other solve these really um, important questions for, for human health. So other things, perhaps, that can be done through sort of crowdsourcing solutions. Raise awareness of this goal to inspire others. It could be in, with, within community groups. It could be our elected officials. Um, 
Can we volunteer, you know, perhaps getting involved with our, uh, volunteering, organizing events and fundraising. You could be a participant. Uh, we could all be participants in some of these studies, uh, donate funds and so forth, and even engage on the entrepreneurial side of things. Because I think if we're successful, there's going to be lots of aspects of success here, which could be data science packages. It could be diagnostics. There could be opportunities for entrepreneurship that perhaps even folks in this crowd, that's your area, you know, and you want to get engaged and be involved. So I think I will leave it at that, and hopefully we have plenty of time for questions. So thank you all for coming tonight. It's a pleasure. Questions, yes. So in your gut brain model, you're thinking about vascularizing it. Have you thought about making a fake vagus nerve pathway? Yeah, that's great. That's a great question. Um, yes, we have. And and Joe and I have talked um, just a, a couple weeks ago about this. Uh, we haven't gotten any for uh, um, Joe. So this is Joe Handelsman, the director of WID. Um, um, I, yeah, I think we haven't, it hasn't gotten much further than, yes, we think we, maybe we should do this crazy. You know, it's like adding another crazy idea on top of, but we have to get there at some point. We have to get there. We have to think how, you know, nerve impulses are connected, are, are, what is the signal there, and how is, that, how is that affecting the connection, right, as opposed, in addition to sort of the, the vascularization. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, that's the, so the vagus nerve um, is definitely on is definitely on the table as something, but that could be a vinegar. It still could be an epigenetic. Ultimately, <laughs> vinegar is acetate. It's two carbon short chain fatty acid. Yes. So I'm thinking about the ever popular truth meter that we read in the paper. <laughs> Which of these is more true to you? It's in our DNA, or we are what we eat. Oh boy, that's like nurture. You, there, you can't win on those arguments, right? You can never win on the nurture versus nature. I think. Um, so, that's a great question. Um, so I'm going to defer to my colleague Alan Addy and. Um, and Federico Ray, who have basically done an experiment with mice where they're trying to, they're basically, they have a, they have a, a mouse, essentially a mouse colony that represents the, as much diversity as there exists within, between humans in terms of the number of differences in DNA sequence. Okay, so they're represented by these eight strains of mice. And they did an experiment where they basically uh, looked at the microbiome, like essentially transfer reactions of, so, so was it the, there's differences, phenotypic differences in these eight strains. And in fact, one of the things that was most, that's very interesting about this is that some of the strains of mice are very susceptible to getting, to being, to be, uh, becoming obese and diabetic. And there's some wild mice that don't, okay? And so everyone thinks, well, it's all, gen it's all, it's got to be all genetics. So they did an experiment where they transferred the microbiota from mice that were largely protected from, from, a crappy, from the bad effects of a crappy diet, this wild strain of mice. They took that microbiota and they gave it to a, a strain of mice that's a lab strain of mice that gets diabetic very quickly, becomes obese and diabetic on a normal, on a fairly normal uh, chow diet. And you could, you basically could prevent the onset of diabetes and obesity just by transferring the microbiota. So in that case, it wasn't 100%. I think Alan said, I'm going to quote him at 70%. 70% what you eat. 30% um, 
diet. Uh, sorry, 30% what you eat. Sorry, 70% what you eat, 30%. I'll get this right. 30% <laughs> genetic. And the other 40%. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, is that? Yeah, okay. You got me, Tom. Yes? What would be sources, useful sources of methanone that we may need to have lots of that? What does one eat? Uh, I mean, meat. Meat. Meat's a good one. That's my favorite way of getting the thionine. <laughs> um, yeah, I think meat, I mean, again, that's, what the, that's why I think this is so fascinating. Because in our, in our human evolution, right? I mean, we didn't have meat every day, presumably, right? So we probably, there were probably times in our <coughs> evolution where we were basically eating stuff that probably didn't have a lot of methionine. Uh, but just enough. Uh, and we survived. And I think, again, some of the mechanisms that we've uncovered, we think are really critical and, and actually we believe they're evolutionarily conserved. Uh, and that the system really tries when, when you have that low methionine. It, it really sets up this, uh, uh, this, this, uh, these pathways to protect um, the epigenome. And what's interesting about that, it's protecting the epigenome, the part of the epigenome that it's protecting is actually the part of the genome that should never get expressed. It's the dark matter. That's what's really, in, yeah, so it's like, it's, it's, it's trying, we think, maybe even first, repress the dark, don't let the dark matter get expressed. Um, because a lot of, there's a lot of um, redundant sequences in those regions, and that can wreck, that can, uh, that can lead to DNA, uh, actually DNA losses, large chromosome losses and things like that. So we think it's a way to, to um, maintain um, um, genome stability. Yes? Connected to the last point that you just shared, um, is there any research uh, in the brain span 100 uh, around uh, uh, calorie restriction? Um, great, great point. Um, in fact, we have a, we work on caloric restriction. Uh, and this is also something that, as many of you probably know, Wisconsin has a, had a long history in studying the effects of caloric restriction, and not only mice, but primarily in primates, non-human primates. Uh, and there it's very clear that, um, you know, a, a, a low-calorie diet, um, uh, without malnutrition, extends lifespan, certainly maximum lifespan, reduces neurodegeneration, increases, uh, low, lowers cardiovascular disease, lowers cancer. I mean, it's, you know, but that's like 30% loss of normal, that's 30% less calories than we probably, most people, than most people would, uh, would eat. So, um, I actually had that as a slot. I had the, I, we don't have data yet on the epigenome and whether or not some of the effects in the first generation, say caloric restriction, let's say um, the animals undergo caloric restriction for uh, several months and they pass their genes on to the next generation and then you do, you do a transgenerational study. Um, I think that would be fascinating. It's a very expensive experiment. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, are some of the health benefits Gen passed on transgenerationally without having that the next generation to under have to have to do caloric restriction. So I think I, I think it's going to be huge. I think the epigenome is going to be widely is is going to be is going to be quite different under caloric restriction. Um, can I? There's just an aside on that I want to bring up because it's, it's only slightly off topic. But it turns out what might actually be critical for caloric restriction, it's not the amount of reduction of calories, perhaps. It's, it might be, yeah, it might be when you fa how long you fast and when you eat, which I think is so much better. <laughs> I really like that result. I know you're not supposed to be biased in science, but I really like that result. <laughs> It's not the amount. It's like how the length of time you fast, and when the fast is. 
and how long it takes you to eat the food. It's just fascinating stuff. Um, and, and so one could ask the question again there, uh, you know, how is the epigenome altered and how is it remembering that for subsequent, you know, if, if you can get the health benefits, you know, during a, that, that, that particular fast, how are they manifest, how do they, how are they, how long does that last, right? I mean, that's another thing too, that I think is really interesting about these, these diet sort of dietary experiments is how long do we really need to do this, right? How long do I need to fast, really, right? Can I take a pill that mimics caloric restriction, right? There's a lot of interest in that area. Uh, I'd still think fasting is probably better. Um, anyhow, I probably should. Kind of related to that, the Dutch have a system where they have a been through the famine in the first two trimesters of their pregnancy, now are old enough to have had children yeah. and maybe grandchildren yes. of their own. Do we know whether that epigenetic change That's is a great question. Yeah. I think the jury's still out on that. The data are still um, not entirely clear, but that's a fantastic question because, you know, some people think about epigenetics as it has to be uh, trans it has to be a passed on to the next generation. What I tried to tell you about today, I tried not to go too far into that direction. Um, it's quite controversial. It's it's the data is not always clear um, what's happening, but certainly epigenetic informa epigenomic information that alters gene expression is really important, and it's important in our own lives, whether or not. And, and it's really a separate question whether or not how much of that information, right, is passed on to the next generation. And there's certainly, I mean, there's certainly evidence um, for trans transgenerational um, epigenetic inheritance, um, but it's extremely difficult to study. Um, and some of the data is 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 less than compelling. But but um, but there's certainly there's certainly evidence. Yes. Something else. I yeah. don't know if you know change yeah. the biome or yeah. can it be changed. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, and, and and again I'll 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 cite some of my colleagues' work on this. Um, uh, Alan Addy's and uh, Alan Addy and, and uh, Frederico Ray, where it looks like the ability to to ha to colonize, like the ability of the, the, the community that's in individual or distinct mouse strains is probably genetically determined, at least to some extent. So how, so how, so, so independent of diet, let's say if, if, you, if you gave the same diet, you started all germ-free mice, uh, g different strains of germ-free mice, and then you ask, okay, I'm going to give you, you're all going to be in the same place with, you know, 100, 200 different strains of just normally occurring bacteria, how are you going to, are you all going to have the same microbiota? And, and the, the data suggests that's not true. So genetics does play a role. So in terms of who colonizes us. So, so it's not totally independent. If that, I think that's one part of your, I mean, that's an, one answer to a, a very complicated uh, and great question. That, that yeah, it, it's hard to know because uh, they, because they're, they're basically, if you know, they're talking to each other, right? The the type of cells and and the, the the, the proteins, and um, you know what the what the bacteria are interacting with in your gut has a lot to do with the particular gene expression, and of proteins that that particular mouse strain is producing that might be slightly different. One amino acid, two amino acids different in. In uh, or, or or even the um, sort of the gl the glycans that are sitting out outside of the cells that the uh, that the bacteria interact with that could be only slightly different between one strain and another strain, but that might play a really major role in the ability of certain bacteria to colonize that that organism or in in the gut, in the gut for instance. 
Yes. Uh, being familiar with all this research, have you made yourself any radical or unusual changes to your diet, or do you stay, or do you stay close to like a you know, mainstream consensus? Of I, that's a diet? great. That's a great. That's a great question. Um, you know. <laughs> um, no, I haven't. <laughs> the bottom line, because, because, um, yeah. And I have colleagues that that are in are in this field, the science scientists elsewhere, who I think believe. I mean, they're quick to start taking small molecules, like things that boost certain metabolites, and. You know, how safe is that? And, and they're taking things that, what if, you know, they're taking large quantities of these things. It's like, well, that, I don't think we've really done the experiment to know if that's okay. Or let's, I mean, think of this too. They're ta maybe they're taking a gram of some molecule, right, that's shown in a number of studies to be, to have a health benefit for humans. Then you run into, the, it's like, well, where is this synthesized? Maybe it's a synthetic compound. Where has it been synthesized? How pure is it? Right? When you take a gram of something, it's a small molecule, there's a ton of that molecule in there, which means there could be 0.1% of something you don't want in there, but that's still 0.1% of a very large amount. <coughs> that's what'll kill you. <laughs> so, so I'm really, you know, I mean, I think I mean, I think diversity is the key, and I think moderation's the key, right? I mean, it, 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 a lot of it comes back to this. I mean, we're all... You know, we all read the new fat, oh, the Mediterranean, you know, the caveman diet, the Mediterranean, you know, the paleo diet. And there's some, you know, there's some good research that has gone into people concluding that, but that doesn't mean we should all be doing that necessarily, right? Do we know enough yet to say that that's how we, should we go back to the hunter-gatherer diet? Well, that's better than a Western diet. <laughs> I think that's pretty clear. I mean, because we spent more time in our evolution as that was our diet, right? It wasn't a Big Mac down this, or taco. I shouldn't say that. I shouldn't, be, I shouldn't be saying those names. Okay. Tom? I mean, we offer absolution. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work. But, <laughs> but we um, offer it. Yes. Um, could you tell us, if you'd like to, and no one took that time too, but could you tell us more about the story of your mom? Oh, okay. Yeah, there's actually, the, and there was another story I forgot to tell you about. So, so my mom, for, for, this was, I guess, about, was it, Anne, was it about five years ago? About five years ago. She's 92, by the way, and we just visited her today um, because there was a health, it's interesting, that's not that interesting, but we're, <laughs> there was a health, I mean, we actually might, I might not have been here today because we got a call that she wasn't doing well. Um, at the nursing home, so um, so uh, turns out she's doing great today. So we were so we're in we're in good spirits today. But she ta so um, she also takes lactate or lactase. You know the the enzyme. I mean, because she's now lactose intolerant, and she take with her ice cream. You know, which she had today. She had her pill of lactase. So anyway, I forgot to bring that into the story the, to, to to the. Presentation today, but the but the but the the um, the um, the fecal transplant. So she had a C so C dif difficile infection forever. It seemed like, uh, and this went on for months. And they thought I had it under control, and it would flare back up. I mean, she was so. You know, her electrolytes were so messed up. She couldn't eat. She couldn't, she wasn't getting any nutrition. She just, she said, you know, she was ready to die. She said, I just feel, I, I'm ready to go now. Uh, and this lasted for months. And um, some brave soul in the Dean health care system, <laughs> um, one of her physicians said, you know, let's do a fecal transplant. And I was... Having, having worked with Federico Ray uh, and, and began to learn more and more about the, micro, the gut microbiome, I'm like, yeah, that's this. Who, what's the worst that could, nothing, there's nothing really bad that's going to come, come from that. It can only be good. 
And so she, I think, was one of the first people five years ago to get a fecal, to have Dean Care pay for a fecal transplant. It's basically a cure for chronic C. diff infections. Within two days, <laughs> she was better. And this had been months where she was like, you know, where we, she was ready, I mean, she really was ready to just die, to, to give up, because uh, she felt so horrible. So that's, I'm like, wow, okay. And she really had, and this has been five years. Um, and, and she chronically, she bef years before that, I think she always, I think she always had a flare. It's not like something you get rid of totally, right? It's just like, you know, it's just part, it's just part of our environment, right? But if it takes over, right, um, th then you're in trouble. But if you put the good guys in, right, they can control each other. The good bacteria, right, from a healthy donor. I don't know who it was. Uh, it wasn't one of her sons. Uh, <laughs> I know that. Um, um, but, but it was just amazing. And I, and, and I think that, that really sold me on the uh, not Not that it needed to be sold that the microbiome and understanding it was not an important area of research. Um, but it just, it just, you know, it just uh, uh, made me that much more excited, I guess, to, to continue down this path. And I'm, I'm continuing down this path. And we have a tremendous microbiome community on this campus, not just the gut microbiome, but uh, microbial uh, and bacterial um, uh, mi microbiology on this campus is, is really amazing, and we need to continue to tap into that um, as we as we move these kinds of projects forward. So, sure. a couple more questions. Uh, what about the other biomes, like a sinus biome? Yeah, right. It's like absolutely. Um, I mean, you know, every orifice, every mucous membrane <laughs> has got has oh, got a micro. <laughs> I mean, you know, there's some pretty, yeah, we're, we're full of it. Um, and, you know, the question is how much, of that, how much of each of those depositories, if you will, has an influence, not, not, not even systemically, but even locally, right? And, uh, I mean, the oral microbiome is also a fascinating area of research, and there's been strong, there's, there's some really good work that, that, that suggests um, there's definitely a, a cardiovascular link um, there to, 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 to or, the oral microbiome. So, yeah, I think, you know, I think we're going to continue to learn. We're not specific. I, I'm just focusing on the gut, and um, I'm still and I'm still learning stuff about the gut and and the and, and what the bugs do there. But 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 I think we need to understand um, how mi the microbiome is influencing. Many aspects of our, not just our gut, but many other places. You've got yeah. three or four more. Two, two questions. Two. Okay. Uh, what is your view of like the work of uh, Dr. Goldie Bird with oxalates that he did back in the 1840s? You know, within that perspective, and the recent work of Dr. Lewis Potcotter uh, with oxalates and the. Uh, microbiome and leaky gut syndrome yeah. in causation with like autism and other yeah. chronic diseases? Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's a great question. Um, we haven't, uh, my group and my, and, the, and my colleagues have not, um, I think, uh, we've not, uh, we haven't dove into that, the leaky gut aspect of this, but I think that has to be, I mean, it's something we're aware of and that we want to think about as we're building, in fact, as we're building uh, a model of the, of in vitro, of the gut, my, uh, my gut, uh, um, um, the gut uh, brain uh, connection, you know, can we induce a leaky gut <coughs> under controlled conditions in that? Uh, but also, Again, add that kind of an experiment. I mean, I'd love to add that experiment to all the ones we're doing, but it just essentially doubles the number of mice and the number of, you know, I, it's a great, yeah, it's a great question. So, so those of you that are, maybe, I don't know if you're, do you want to, maybe you should talk about the, the, the data, the, 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 ba the, the, the idea that if, if um, and if I get it wrong, please let me know. 
that uh, you know, there's certain ways you can induce a leaky gut. So basically, you screw up the, the barrier, uh, the intestinal barrier, uh, with the rest of the body. And basically what can happen is you start to get molecules that don't normally get in, are getting in. And they are having an auto, they can have an autoimmune uh, flash in, in systemically. Some of these things are thought perhaps to even get to the brain. They might even influence the, the uh, blood-brain barrier and, and, and cause uh, some leakiness within the, 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 the uh, blood-brain barrier, which is another bad thing. Um, so there's a lot to, yeah, so there's a lot to do. And, and those could be induced by the oxalates you talked about, other, other things, you know, other neuro, uh, not neuroinflammation, but, but other kind of chronic inflammation in the gut might also be a way to screw up the barrier. There's probably many more ways than oxalates to screw up uh, the, 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 the barrier. And so that's also another fascinating area. What is it, right? What is it, what, what are the, some of the other um, molecules perhaps uh, that could influence that, that barrier? And, and again, what are the molecules? At the end of the day, right, it's what are the molecules that are inducing it? Is it, a, is it, is it through, uh, you know, uh, the nervous system? Is it through circulating metabolites? Is it through a leaky gut, which now just allows some of these molecules that hadn't been there before and the body doesn't normally see, and it says, holy crap, what's this? And mounts a response that's an autoimmune response that's not, you know, that's unhealthy, uh, especially if it's neuroinflammation in the brain, for instance. And then you have a follow-up. Uh, one last question here. Sure. Uh, you mentioned about the, uh, like a fecal transplant. And Oxalate or formagenes. genes. Do you know of any that can be ingested that can get through the digestive system without doing a fecal transplant? Um, probably not. I think what's I think what's trying what folks are trying to develop now is 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 a pill that only would be uh, that that would be essentially dissolved and released past the intestine, so that you know past the the stomach, so that. Because a lot of the, those those bacteria are not going to survive. The ones that are living, you know, in your in your distal colon, they're not going to be, um, they're not going to survive the stomach. Most of them, so um, the stomach acids. So, so you haven't heard of anything, in other words. No, I I don't. Th I you know I I don't. I, that's the goal. I just don't know what's on. If there's something on the market now that that people I. Well, they yeah. have probiotics. Yeah, that no, 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 are, but I, you know, that, that well, that's, that's formulated for that. But I haven't heard of any testing of that. Yeah, well, I think that I think that's files, yeah, say. and I think that's a a point of, to to an earlier question about, you know, has this has <laughs> should I do I take probiotics? You know, things like that, and it's like, well, gosh, um, I don't know if that. I mean, there's a lot of the. I would be careful uh, because are they really getting are they are they having the advance are they having the effect you you're anticipating right are they even surviving right if you're orally ingesting them and they won't their their main place is in the is in the colon are they are they getting there and and also are you you know how natural is that right to having a a large collection of a single or, or or a small number of microbiota, right? It's just like you, you could think of it. That's why I'm skeptical of probiotics. How do we do? We know enough yet that we should be taking probiotics? I'm not sure. There's about 100 to 200 different species of bacteria in our colon. I don't know of any probiotic that handles that. Just eat well. And they'll they will find they'll populate, you know. John, you yes. Are several of your lab folks are here. Would you yeah. Oh sure, sure. There's Anna Lindahl right there. <laughs> uh, Alexis Alexis Lawton, Mark Klein, Slava, <laughs> Eric Armstrong, Spencer Spencer Hawes. Uh, I can't. I can't see who's in the back. Wallace? Is that Wallace? Okay. <laughs> Lily? Uh, Rush? Mitchell? We're missing a few. 
Lily's there, yes. <laughs> yes. So I talked about Spencer. Did I, who else? Did I, who else did I tell? So some of these guys are working on other aspects of, of so caloric restriction, talk to Rush. <laughs> He's just, we've just finished like a, finished like a, five, a four or five year study on, in mice uh, and looking at the effects of caloric restriction on, on longevity and, and mitochondrial function. Just pretty wild stuff, I think. Um, now I have to go fetch my daughter. So, so okay. Um,